everyone, my name is Katie and I am a third year first grade teacher and welcome to my channel. Today's video is going to be all about EdTPA. It is something that you have to do as a student teacher for teacher certification in a lot of different states across the country. And it's something that I did while I was in school. So I thought I would bring you my six biggest tips for those of you who are about to start working on your EdTPA. Before we jump into the tips, let's start with a little bit about my EdTPA experience. I did my EdTPA portfolio in 2017 in a first grade classroom, actually at the school that I teach at now. When I graduated, EdTPA was not required for certification, but my university was pilot launching the program, and so I participated and went ahead and submitted my EdTPA and got official scores from Pearson. I completed the elementary EdTPA portfolio, which means I had four tasks, three that were reading, and one mathematics. After I graduated in May of 2017, I went ahead and got my master's degree and I worked as a grad assistant. So I helped some of the professors in the department at our university that were in charge of this pilot launch. So I helped a lot of students submit their EdTPA through Pearson and I also helped speak at some of the sessions that they had to get students prepared to complete EdTPA. I found out during that time that I really enjoyed helping students make sense of the portfolio assessment and see how it would fit in with their student teaching. Of course, there's only so much help that I can give because the rules say I can't do your EdTPA for you, but I'm hoping these tips will get you on the right track. So all of that to say, I can sympathize with what you're going through with EdTPA. It is kind of difficult and it seems like a lot, but I'm hoping that these six tips will help break it down for you and help you make some good next steps going forward. Let's answer the big question, what is EdTPA? EdTPA is basically just creating a teaching portfolio. In fact, the beginning of the handbook say it's a performance-based assessment where you get to do the following things. You write lessons, film yourself teaching them, and then you reflect on how your teaching went and give feedback to your students. So not too difficult. It's kind of like what you would do in a normal student teaching situation, just a little bit more in depth. A lot of the time, I remember helping students when I was a grad assistant and they were freaking out about EdTPA. Don't get me wrong. I had some freak out moments too. But that takes me into tip number one. Tip number one to conquer EdTPA is to breathe. That's right, breathe. If you're starting out overwhelmed and you're not sure where to go, just stop for a minute and take a second. It's really not that overwhelming. A lot of people will say it's the worst experience of their life, <laughs> the worst thing they did in student teaching. I didn't have that experience. I didn't think it was the worst thing of my life or the worst thing for student teaching. Was it difficult? Yes. Was it the end of the world? No. You've got this. Take a deep breath. Remember that the portfolio is just a more in-depth way of you writing lessons and reflecting on your teaching. When you become an actual teacher, your lessons won't always have to be that in-depth, but it's great practice to plan out every step and really reflect on the whole lesson planning process to prepare you to be a teacher. EdTPA is really just best practice teaching, and you've been learning that in your preparation program. So don't panic, don't freak out. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out, and know that this is what you've been preparing for in school. Tip number two, and I think this is probably the biggest one. Tip two is print your handbook. Yes, it's long. Yes, it will take a lot of trees. But when you print it, you're gonna have that handbook there, hard copy for you to look through to make sure you get every single detail out of it. You can write on it, you can highlight, you can circle, and that's really gonna help you understand exactly what they're looking for in your EdTPA portfolio. Let me show you what I did with my handbook. This is my handy EdTPA binder. Yes, I was extremely extra and decorated the cover quite a bit and the spine, but hey, if that brought me joy, it's the little things. A little bit of joy when I open up my work. All right, so I printed out the handbook and used divider tabs to separate it into all of my different tasks. So I have a tab for task one, a tab for task two, task three, task four, a section for other, 
and a glossary section. And then I had a section where I printed out the state standards for the grade level that I was in and included those in my EdTPA binder as well. I also used the tabs to hold printouts of my lesson plans and the back side to hold student work so I could keep everything in one place. Step three, and you are not gonna like step three, but I promise it's important. Step three is to read the handbook. You did not kill an entire tree just to put it in a binder and set it on a shelf. Read your handbook. When I was helping students, all the professors would say the handbook is your Bible for EdTPA. Is that a little dramatic? Maybe, I don't really know, but it really does tell you everything you need to know for your portfolio. Most of the time, the answers to your biggest EdTPA questions can be found right inside your handbook. You just have to know where to look. It's important to read the whole handbook before you start working on your EdTPA. Each task has a different chunk or a different piece, but they all work together. Task one is all about planning. Task two is all about executing and teaching. You need to know what they're looking for in your teaching in order to plan effectively. Task three is all about student learning, assessing their learning and then giving them feedback. You need to know what they're looking for in your assessment in order to plan your lessons because you have to plan your assessments into your lessons. And then task four for elementary is mathematics. It's kind of one on its own, so you can read mathematics when you're ready to tackle that beast. But if you don't read the whole thing, you don't get the overall picture of what they're looking for. All right, time for tip number four. Tip number four is to analyze the rubrics. When I started my EdTPA, all of my professors were like fives. You wanna go for fives because that's the highest you can get on each rubric. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna get a five on every rubric. Okay, I didn't really get a five on every rubric. I did get quite a few, but not on every rubric. But here's what I did to help me analyze the rubrics and find out what I need. If I open up my binder, each task has the rubrics in the back. So there's the section where it tells you what you need to do and gives you all your information. And then at the back, it'll come into the rubrics for that task. I went through and read every rubric and looked at the threes, fours, and fives, because that's what I wanted to get. And I looked to see what was the difference between a three and a four. Sometimes the difference between a three and a four is just one little thing that you need to put in your commentary. It could be one little mention of a child's background knowledge that they're looking for to give you that four. Same with fours and fives. I said, okay, what do I need to do to take a four and bump it up to a five? Because again, sometimes it's just a little thing to add in your teaching or a little thing to put into your commentary and they'll say, oh, okay, that's a five. So I went through in every single rubric, I read each standard and I made a note of what made this different, a three from a four, or what made a four different from a five. I really feel like that helped me get a better grasp on not only the assessment itself, but what I needed to do to be successful. And I would say that's probably how I got a couple fives thrown in there. Tip number five is to start your context for learning the first week of your internship. If you're watching this and you've already started student teaching, don't worry, just go back tomorrow and get started. Context for learning is probably the easiest part and it will require some conversations with your cooperating teacher. The context for learning is just a document that overviews your classroom, the demographics of your students, the area that your student teaching in, the curriculums and programs that they use that you might incorporate into your lesson, and any other background information they need to know about your students. The good news about the context for learning is you can get started on that right away and you don't even have to start lesson planning before you do it. Take that first week of your student teaching or the first week from here forward and really get to know every student in your class. Get to know the programs you teach and the programs you use for reading and for math. Where are your students from? Where are they on an academic level? Get to know all of those things that a teacher would know about their class and go ahead and start that context for learning. Don't put it off, it's not too tricky, but you also need to do that before you start your plans. That way you have a better handle on what your students know and how you can tailor to their individual needs. All right, my last tip, tip number six for EdTPA, is set aside some time to work on your EdTPA. 
I know it seems like an overwhelming task and it is a lot of work. So I would set aside maybe two nights a week where you're gonna focus a certain number of hours on working on your NTPA. You will probably have to work outside of those time frames sometimes, especially when you're in task one and you're working on planning those lessons because that's a little more time sensitive. You have to have those planned by a certain time so you can teach the lesson where it is in the pacing for your student teaching. But setting aside a couple evenings guarantees that you're gonna have time to sit down and really focus on your NTPA. Some other things that helped me were going to a place where I knew that I could focus to work. I went to the library on campus a lot, and of course, bringing a coffee with you or a soda with you, something that you love and enjoy, just to get you a little bit of energy, a little bit of extra joy in there. I also met up with some other students who were working on their EdTPA as well. So I had some friends who were also going through the pilot program with me, and we would sit and work on our EdTPA together at a specific table. That way, if there was ever a time that we felt like we were just running around in circles and didn't know what we were talking about, we had each other to bring ourselves back and say, okay, it's not that bad. Read the question again and find out what it's really asking you to do. I hope these tips helped you in your journey to finish your EdTPA, and I really hope they gave you some next steps. Motivation is great, and we all need that, but next steps are important, especially when you're completing something as daunting as EdTPA. So remember, it's not the end of the world, you will survive, and it's just best practice teaching a little more in depth. But you can do it, you are prepared. If these tips were helpful for you, please click the like down below and click on subscribe to see more teaching content. I also want to know if you're doing EdTPA. So if you are a student teacher and you're working on your EdTPA now, leave a comment below and let me know when you're gonna graduate and what grade you're working on with your EdTPA. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.